Good morning. Uh, we're pleased to be joined uh, live via video link uh, from Kabul today with General John W. Nicholson. He assumed duties as Commander of Resolute Support and U.S. Forces Afghanistan in March. Uh, General, if you can hear us, uh, we'll turn it over to you for your opening remarks. Oh, thanks very much, Jeff. I can hear you loud and clear. And uh, I can't see you at the other end, but uh, welcome. And I just want to say, uh, since this is my first Pentagon press briefing, thanks to all of you for covering our mission in Afghanistan. I know I've seen some of you here as you travel through the secretary and the chairman and others, and look forward to hosting uh, any of the others of you that choose to come here. But again, thanks for covering the mission. I look forward to talking about any aspect of that with you here today. I do want to give a few opening comments um, looking at current operations that we're conducting. Uh, as, as we know, uh, President Obama has identified Islamic State, Daesh, as uh, one of our top security threats. Uh, he has indicated we will destroy Daesh wherever we find them. Secretary Carter has also said that wherever Daesh metastasizes, as it has done so here in Afghanistan, that we will go after it, and we are. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our operations against that regional affiliate here in Afghanistan, which is called the Islamic State Khorasan Province. Uh, last December, they had expended, ex expanded to an area of about 10 districts in southern Nangarhar. Uh, in January, the president gave U.S. forces here in Afghanistan counterterrorism authorities to strike Daesh, uh, and we began to do so. So since then, U.S. and Afghan partnered forces uh, have uh, attacked Daesh and begun to reduce their area of control. This has included attacks by the Taliban against Daesh as well. So now since January, their area has shrunk to about uh, three or four districts, parts of three or four districts in southern Nangarhar. Uh, as you're aware, uh, they are committing the same kinds of atrocities here in Afghanistan that they are noted for elsewhere, killing innocent men, women, children, uh, and and Saturday's attack in Kabul is another indication of their brutality, where they uh, detonated a suicide bomb and killed uh, upwards of 80 uh, innocent Afghans who were out um, doing, and participating in a peaceful demonstration. I would highlight, however, that the fact that they could conduct a high-profile attack is, should not be perceived as a sign of growing strength. Uh, sadly, we have seen high-profile attacks conducted in uh, Belgium, France, Germany, even the United States, uh, and this is not necessarily a sign of growing strength in Afghanistan. Indeed, their area is shrinking. So as part of the larger Afghan campaign plan for 2016, which is called Operation Shafak, uh, the Afghan security forces began operations in the north, defending the area around Kunduz. They then shifted uh, to southern Afghanistan, where they conducted Again, more uh, successful defensive operations there, and now they have shifted their main effort to the east. And President Ghani has visited Nangarhar, given instruction to his security forces to destroy Daesh. Uh, and so this operation being conducted against them is partnered with Afghan security forces and is part of the Afghan national campaign plan. I should point out also that this was planned and had been initiated before the attack in Kabul on Saturday. So in keeping with, with our two missions, and again, U.S. forces in Afghanistan have a counterterrorism mission and a train, advise, and assist mission, we are utilizing our counterterrorist authorities to attack Daesh and southern Nangarhar. We are also partnered with some of the Afghan special forces as we conduct these operations. Thus far, the operations have been successful. We have uh, helped the Afghan security forces to reclaim significant portions of the territory that was previously controlled by Daesh. Uh, we have killed many Daesh commanders and soldiers, destroyed key infrastructure, capabilities, logistical nodes, uh, and Daesh fighters are retreating south into the mountains of southern Nangarhar as we speak. And while successful, as with any counterterrorism operation, uh, there's always some risk, and indeed, some of our service members uh, have been wounded in this operation, total of five. None of these are life-threatening injuries. Uh, two of the service members have already been returned to duty with their units. The other three were evacuated out of theater. They're in good spirits. They've talked to their families. 
we expect a full recovery. Uh, we will continue to stay after Daesh uh, until they are defeated here in Afghanistan. Uh, while at the same time, we'll continue with our train, advise, assist mission with our Afghan partners. So ultimately, uh, in the future, they will be able to do these missions entirely on their own. So this fight against Daesh is critical. It's nested within a larger global strategy against Islamic State. It, uh, in fact, coincides with ongoing operations in Iraq and Syria. And again, by fighting groups like Daesh and Al-Qaeda here in Afghanistan, we deny them sanctuary and we uh, inhibit their ability to conduct transnational attacks from here. So I would, I would note that Daesh is only one of nine uh, U.S. designated terrorist organizations here in Afghanistan. Additionally, there are three other violent extremist organizations. Uh, these uh, groups are the principal focus of our counterterrorism mission, and the, the purpose of helping the Afghans to build their capabilities so that they can maintain pressure on these uh, enemy groups and, and prevent them from realizing their transnational ambitions. I would say overall, our mission in Afghanistan is on a positive trajectory. I can elaborate on that uh, with you later. But thus far, uh, in keeping with the campaign plan that I outlined, uh, we have seen the Afghans successfully defend each of these areas, largely by taking offensive operations against the enemy, and the Taliban has not yet been able to realize any of their territorial ambitions this year. And with that, Jeff, let me turn it back over to you for any questions. Press. Thank you, uh, General Nicholson. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, just a quick follow-up on your reference to the five Americans who were wounded. Um, I didn't quite catch if you described and could describe a little more fully the circumstances of that. And, and secondly, could you give us a, a, a rundown on what's going on in Helmand Province? Are, is the U.S. involved in uh, supporting Afghan offensive operations down there under these new authorities currently? Right. Thanks for the question. Uh, to elaborate a little bit, and I don't want to get into too much detail for operational security and and privacy reasons, frankly, for the wounded soldiers. But it was on a partnered operation, meaning uh, U.S. special operators with Afghan special operators conducting the operation. Uh, and they were uh, clearing some of these areas that I mentioned uh, in southern Nangahar, where uh, Daesh previously had control, and they were helping our Afghan partners to regain control of those areas. So, so that was really the nature of the operation, offensive operation, counterterrorism operation, partnered operation. Uh, shifting to Helmand, uh, as you're aware, uh, Helmand uh, experienced a tough fight last year with the 215th Corps, the Afghan Corps down there. At the end of the fighting season last year, uh, the Afghans uh, put in new leadership at the Corps level, all the brigades, and we helped them to regenerate six of their Kandaks. Uh, they consolidated their positions they now hold between central Sangin all the way down to uh, the Garmashir area, and they're able to conduct operations in outlying areas from there. They have successfully conducted uh, earlier this year clearing operations uh, all the way from Lashkargah up to the Sangin District Center and clearing operations from Lashkargah out into Marja and the Marja District Center. So generally speaking, uh, the Afghan security forces have accomplished their objectives in Helmand thus far, uh, securing the major population centers. Uh, the enemy was active earlier in the year, attacking isolated checkpoints, but uh, frankly, in the last two weeks, the enemy activity has dropped off to a, to a much lower level. Now, uh, fighting season's not over. We anticipate we'll see other enemy attempts uh, to regain territory in Helmand, but thus far, uh, things are on a real positive trajectory in the 215th Corps. Next, we'll go to uh, Courtney Cuby from NBC News. Hi, General. Uh, one more on the, the wounded Americans in Nangahar. Can you just give us a little better sense of exactly what they were doing in this partnered operation when they were wounded and how they were wounded? Were they in the middle of a gun battle, or was it, uh, was it all one incident? Were the operations in Nangahar involved Afghan special forces uh, clearing areas that had been held by Daesh. So 
uh, in clearing operations. These are preceded by airstrikes, and the airstrikes have been going on there really since January, since the president uh, gave us the authorities to do that. And then there were there were strikes, of course, in the immediate uh, time preceding this operation. And then the Afghan security forces went in to retake the ground that had been held by Daesh. So I'd characterize it as a clearing operation, uh, where the Afghan forces were moving south into the areas that were occupied by Daesh. Uh, the um, nature of the combat there, you know, uh, g small arms fire, I would say, some shrapnel. Uh, these were these were the nature of the injuries uh, that they experienced. And uh, th so, th so does that give you a sense of the uh, of the type of operation? Th this is what they were conducting. Thank you very much. And then just one more. Um, on ISIS, the ISIS presence in Afghanistan, can you just sort of give us an update? You said that the, you've killed many of their fighters and soldiers. What's the, the estimate now for how many are there? And you gave an interview to the AP, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember if it was yesterday or the day before, where you mentioned that a lot of the ISIS fighters you believe are former TTP fighters who are now moving into ISIS. Are you seeing a, a, an increase in that recently? And can you give us any numbers on how many TTP may be now fighting under the ISIS flag? Right, yeah, great question. So um, when we began our operations in January, we estimated that ISIS would, might have numbered around 3,000. They were primarily located in southern Nangarhar and in Kunar provinces. Uh, we, uh, many of these fighters were members of other groups that had uh, really changed allegiances. Now, I call this convergence, and the convergence would be, again, amongst these nine terrorist groups and three violent extremist organizations, we see periodically members, members changing from one organization to another. In the, in the case of Islamic State Khorasan province, the majority of the members are from the Tureki Taliban Pakistan, which has been the anti-Pakistan government Taliban. Uh, many of these uh, personnel were forced out of Pakistan by um, Pakistan military offensive operations, ZARB-YARB, which was a large-scale offensive operation they conducted. In the case of the IS fighters in southern Nangarhar, we see that many of them come from the Oryxai Agency, which is south of Nangarhar, actually south of the Khyber Agency, and they were former members of the TTP, uh, with, complete with their leadership, who wholesale joined Islamic State pledge buyout uh, to Islamic State and join them earlier this year. So 70% roughly of those fighters are from the TTP, and uh, many of them are Pakistani Pashtun from the Oryxai Agency. We also see members of the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan uh, as well who have joined uh, the organization, although some of them have also uh, returned to their original colors, if you will. Uh, and this number that uh, originally was 3,000, we think, has been roughly cut in half. Uh, we estimate them between now between 1,000 and 1,500 uh, at the present time. But it's uh, again, it's very hard to say. Uh, it's very dynamic uh, battlefield down there, uh, and of course, it's easy to uh, uh, miss people in the mountains there. But we think we've reduced their numbers uh, fairly significantly in the last uh, six months. If I could just one more about the wounded Americans, what was the date of that attack? Well, this operation has been going on for a week. This has just occurred in the last few days. Okay, yeah, next we'll go to uh, June to our body with Reuters. Um, thank you, uh, General. Um, we know that the Taliban have, um, have gained a little bit of territory since the beginning of the year. Can you talk about um, whether that's because of sort of a strategic withdrawal of Afghan forces in order to shore up? Um, their forces elsewhere, or kind of what, what are some of the factors behind that slight gain in territory? Uh, sure. Now, again, we can discuss in greater detail, you know, which territory is controlled versus which territory they have a presence in. So we, we, we would sort of estimate that the Taliban would have a presence in uh, maybe a third of the country, but in terms of actual control, uh, we think uh, 10 districts out of the 400 where they actually would have what we would call control. There's other districts where they have some influence, uh, where they have a greater degree of presence, but again, this is being contested. One thing to understand about the Afghan campaign plan in 16 versus 2015 is that after 2015, learning from the operations last year, the Afghans decided to concentrate their effort in key parts of the country. So as I mentioned in my opening statement, 
They started in the Kunduz area with the necessity to defend that from the Taliban. They did that successfully in the April-May time frame and inflicted heavy casualties uh, on the Taliban up there and, in fact, prevented them from seizing Kunduz again. Uh, though we still see a presence in the northern districts, north of Kunduz, as example, Archie District and so forth up there. But again, they don't control the district centers and they don't control the provincial capital. Uh, so that kind of gives you a sense of the nature of the Taliban presence uh, and the degree of control. They're largely in rural areas, in the villages in rural areas, but not in the district centers and, and, and in none of the uh, provincial capitals. Now, what we've seen down in the south uh, is somewhat similar, but I should mention, um, I, we, we assess the Taliban ha have been disrupted uh, by the death of Mullah Mansour that occurred on the 21st of May, and that this disruption, even though they would like us to believe that they recover from this quickly, they appointed their new leader, uh, Haibatullah, within one week, but in fact, many of the tensions that existed in the Taliban under Mansour have if anything, been exacerbated further with the uh, rapid succession of Haibatullah. So this rapid uh, succession process was not very inclusive. Many of the uh, Taliban leaders who were not uh, in, in support of Mansour are, remain unsupportive of Haibatullah. We also see evidence that uh, Mansour had misdirected a lot of the Taliban revenues for his own purposes. And in fact, since his death, because of his tight control over Taliban finances, in fact, uh, the Taliban are having trouble getting control of their own finances. So this disruption of finances, disruption amongst the leadership, the fact that the Taliban fighters are uh, fighting and dying inside Afghanistan while their leaders are living in sanctuary and safety elsewhere, all of this has undermined the cohesion and the effectiveness of the Taliban. Now, this doesn't mean that they won't be able to uh, conduct uh, high-profile attacks. They won't be able to conduct isolated attacks. We fully expect to see more of that this year. But what they have been unable to do is to seize and hold any terrain. And we think that at the end of 2015, after their brief success in Kunduz, they believed they were going to be able to seize and hold terrain, and they failed to do so. Uh, so this, uh, this fight is not over. But I would say they were cautiously optimistic the Afghan security forces are on a positive trajectory in, uh, in going after the Taliban. This all fits within President Ghani's approach of fight, fracture, talk. So they fight the Taliban hard, deny them their objectives, try to peel elements off and reconcile with them. There's at least two of these groups that are in various stages of conversations with the Afghan government. Uh, and then eventually uh, this would ideally lead to a... Uh, larger and larger number of Taliban fighters choosing to lay down their arms and reconcile with the government. Okay, thank you. Just a couple other quick ones. Um, when we saw you um, in Afghanistan a couple weeks ago, you said that the new authorities um, granted by President Obama had been used like a couple dozen times, so approximately once per day. Um, is that, has that pace sort of continued? Yes. So I've been uh, using those authorities daily uh, since the president gave them to us. I uh, greatly appreciate those. As I mentioned, since the Afghans are on a more of an offensive trajectory, the ability to use the new authorities, which essentially allow us to support them while in offensive operations, are come in very handy and really help them to maintain the momentum that they're gaining. So yes, we continue to use those authorities on a daily basis. And of course, using authorities does not always mean a, a, an airstrike. It may mean uh, reconnaissance aircraft. It may mean armed reconnaissance. It may mean rotary wing support. So. It enables me to use my combat enablers in support of the Afghans as they uh, execute their um, strategic effects uh, under their campaign plan. A little bit about the, the um, attack in Kabul um, uh, by Islamic State. Um, what is that? What is their ability to, to launch to have such a large um, uh, bombing in, in Kabul uh, say to you about their, their ability to operate in the country and um, you know, kind of their, uh, yeah, just, just their ability to operate in the country. Thanks. Yeah, we, again, uh, they launched a suicide attack against innocent people who were peacefully demonstrating uh, on behalf of, uh, of their desire um, for more electricity and, their, and bombing on province. It, it just shows, again, targeting innocent victims, uh, no... Um, uh, th there was no uh, 
purpose behind it other than that was to uh, inflict terror and uh, inflict casualties on uh, innocent Afghan victims. This, I would say, it's not a sign of strength that someone can conduct a suicide attack. I, I, I would draw your attention again back to the high-profile attacks that have occurred in Europe and the United States. Uh, tragic events, but not a sign of a movement necessarily that is growing in strength, merely that it has the capability to conduct these uh, attacks. Uh, the uh, Kabul is uh, is still a a city with a number of threat streams. The Afghan security forces work extremely hard and do a tremendous job at interrupting and uh, interdicting many of these threat streams. So uh, what we're seeing is, I think, a, a an improvement in Afghan ability to interdict these threat streams as they come forward. Slightly fewer high-profile attacks than last year at this time, even though, again, we're facing nine uh, designated terrorist organizations uh, in the region. Next to uh, Carla Babb with Voice of America. Hi, General. Thank you for doing this. Um, good to see you again. I was wondering, you had said that you continue to use your new authorities on a daily basis. Do you know how many airstrikes have been carried out under these new authorities? The, uh, since January, uh, we've conducted about 470 airstrikes, just to give you a roll up. Uh, a counter terrorist strike, specific counter terrorist strikes, about 180. Under the new authorities, which are called strategic effects, which have been in effect since early June, uh, about 40 uh, airstrikes, uh, plus or minus. So, again, the use of authority, you know, the designation of an area as being under the authorities does not necessarily mean we immediately follow with an airstrike. But, uh, I think that'll give you a sense of the numbers. Thank you. And then I just wanted to follow up on the, the positioning of U.S. troops, because when we spoke to you a couple weeks ago, um, you talked about shifting to the east, and you talked about some of the, the injuries in southern Nangarhar. Are the troops that were in Helmand, are they going to be shifting to southern Nangarhar? Is that an accurate assessment of where the U.S. troops are going to be? And if that is the case, does that mean um, that in the south, they're in that holding pattern? Because you had mentioned to us a couple weeks ago that they were either going to be going on the offensive or holding or disrupting, I think, were the three words that you used. Does that mean that they're, they're in hold? Right. So uh, let me just take a second and describe that. So, th so this, what you're referencing, is the overall Afghan strategy for 2016, Operation Shafak, uh, and what, uh, which means dawn. And it's part of what the Afghans call a sustainable security strategy. So the idea is that the Afghans uh, will focus their efforts on certain areas. And mainly, this is the key population centers, the ring road, the major economic arteries within the country. And so these areas are generally designated as areas they will hold or they will fight for. And so if it's a hold or a fight area, then the Afghan security forces will immediately act to interdict, defeat any enemy effort to, to gain ground in those areas. There are other areas in the country where they will disrupt uh, enemy operations, but they, they're not seeking to hold uh, or fight for those areas. Now, the air, all the areas we've mentioned today, Central Helmand, uh, Kabul, uh, Nangarhar, are all in this fight or hold category. Uh, at the Afghan forces are distributed around the country in these areas. So the, uh, the forces uh, in Nangarhar, for example, are advised by a group of advisors that stay with that force. So, so the forces uh, in, in Helmand, Kandahar, Nangarhar each have their own set of U.S. advisors who stay with those forces and assist them in their operations. And then if we invoke authorities, those advisors would assist in applying those authorities, you know, calling in an airstrike, et cetera, uh, using uh, reconnaissance uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, et cetera. So these are the kinds of things that we do. So the Afghans have shifted their main effort uh, up to the east from Helmand to Nangarhar, and uh, then we assist them uh, by moving, say, our uh, ISR assets, our air power, et cetera, to that area uh, in accordance with our counterterrorism authorities to assist them. Uh, so this is how we kind of move assets around the country. The Afghans also move their own assets. They move their own air power, the A-29 aircraft, the MD-530 helicopters, the MI-17 uh, modified uh, forward firing uh, variants. So they move assets around as well. They move their special forces around. 
The Afghan Special Forces are one of the critical enablers that the Afghans have, about 17,000 of them. And they're the most effective forces, uh, uh, counterterrorism forces, really in the entire region. So when the Afghans have a major effort, they will move their special forces to that area, and then they uh, have yet uh, really to, to be defeated uh, anywhere this year. So, th so this is a way in which the Afghans weight the main effort, and that's how we support them with that. For a few more minutes, General, I want to go to Tom Bowman uh, from NPR. Thanks for doing this, General. You talked about the Afghan special forces, and you know, there's a lot of talk that these guys are kind of spread too thin, that they're called upon at all times to kind of put out the fire over there. Um, are you looking, or are they looking at expanding the Afghan special forces or, or anything along those lines, giving them more of a rest? Because clearly they're being called on for everything. Absolutely right, Tom. Uh, the, they are, uh, they, they have become kind of the firemen, if you will, and uh, are moved around rapidly. We work closely with our Afghan, uh, the senior leadership of the Afghan military to ensure that the special forces are kept in an, what we call an operational cycle so that they are employed, but then they get a chance to rotate out, refit, uh, retrain, take leave, you know, see their families, then they get back into the fight. And so uh, they're the only force in the Afghan army, candidly, that has this kind of operational cycle. But as you point out, because they're so good, the temptation is to use them everywhere and then to leave them in the fight. And so we are working closely with our Afghan partners on this. And I have to say, uh, what we're seeing is uh, for a young army, uh, what, what we're seeing is kind of rapid growth in the understanding of how to employ these forces and of the need to regenerate forces before you put them back into the fight. Uh, I would point out that many of the leaders of the Afghan security forces have been at war for decades. I mean, so their entire adult lives, they have been at war. So when we come in with our Western notions of operational cycles and force regeneration, it is somewhat new to them because this is what they do. So, but uh, uh, in spite of that, um, we are finding they are, they are seeing the benefits of this and responding to that. And in fact, um, professionalizing in a way that, uh, which we're very proud uh, in, in, as, a, as their advisors. And so we're seeing progress on that. Um, to your question about increasing the size, currently no. Uh, but what, we're, what we are trying to do is take some of the methods we, that have proven so successful with the special forces and bring those over to the conventional force, you know, the operational cycle, the retraining. Uh, and so as we go into the winter with the Afghan security forces this year, uh, in fact, we're going to work very hard on uh, realizing this op the same operational cycle with the conventional forces that we have with the special forces. Okay, uh, we'll go to Bill Hennigan from the uh, Los Angeles Times. This may be our last one here. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, as long as we're on the Afghan forces, I was wondering what the uh, casualty numbers were this year regarding um, Afghan forces and whether that number was um, higher or lower than last year. Thanks, Tom. Uh, it's a great question. It is one of the areas we're concerned about. The casualties are trending about 20% higher. Now, last year, the Afghans uh, took high casualties, about 20,000 total casualties, which is tough for a young army. But I would also say it was equally impressive to see how a, again, relatively young army recovered from that and demonstrated real resiliency. So I mentioned the regeneration effort in Helmand that has resulted in, in greater battlefield success this year. I think uh, what's happening, and again, uh, we, we're studying this closely, is what we saw happen this year is that the Taliban continued their fight into the winter months. So earlier this year, in January, February, March, whereas in the past, in 2015, for example, there was not a lot of fighting. This year, there was more fighting. So the Afghans continued uh, to take casualties steadily throughout the year and through the winter. And so now, uh, what we're seeing is I think the majority of that overage is due to the fighting that occurred early in the year of 2016 as compared to last year when there was little fighting going on early in the year. But uh, we're, we're studying it. Uh, there are other reasons we're looking at. You know, it's uh, many of these casualties occur on static checkpoints. We're working hard with the Afghan police and army to reduce their dependency on checkpoints. 
Checkpoints are important for political and social reasons. Communities feel safer if there's a police or an army checkpoint. So it's not a, a simple matter of telling them to stop having checkpoints. So there's a political dimension to it as well. So it's a multidimensional solution, uh, but we're working closely with them on that and then helping them to establish the ability to regenerate forces uh, once they get a chance to, uh, to do so uh, after a tough period of fighting. General, it's uh, uh, 1131. We promised to end you by 1130. Uh, any, any other closing uh, comments or anything you wanted uh, to pass on to us? I wanted to say again, uh, thanks very much for your focus on, on this uh, campaign in Afghanistan. Uh, we, we think the Afghans, again, are on a positive trajectory. I don't want to overstate it, but at the same time, uh, they, they are doing some things very well this year, uh, and we are seeing some progress. Fight's not over. We expect we'll see more uh, attempts by the enemy uh, to conduct high-profile attacks. Uh, but again, they have not been successful in uh, seizing territory, district centers, provincial capitals, and as, as we know, this was their objective this year. So uh, we're very proud of our Afghan teammates. Uh, we, are, we also, uh, I also want to note the very uh, positive results of the Warsaw Summit that occurred and, and uh, let you all know how great this has been for Afghan morale. Uh, the Afghan people are more encouraged by the strong international commitment. The Afghan uh, military and security forces are very encouraged. Their morale is up. Uh, as well as the Afghan government. So this, uh, this strong demonstration of commitment by President Obama uh, and by all of our international partners here has gone a long way uh, to encouraging the Afghans. And then the final comment is the Afghans are taking this fight to the enemy. Uh, so uh, we have great partners here in the Afghans. Uh, they're willing, they're able. Uh, with our assistance, they will take the fight to these nine terrorist groups and these uh, three VEOs. And it's much better to fight them here uh, than in our homeland. Jeff, thanks very much, and uh, look forward to seeing you all again uh, here, either here in Afghanistan or back in Washington. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks, everybody.